Yes. Hey, welcome, everybody. My name is Jennifer Griffith, and I work at NMOA, which is the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association. And for those of you that don't know what NMOA is, I've got the website showing so that people can read themselves. Um, Ron, are you seeing the NMOA website on your screen? Yes. Good. So uh, NMOA is the six New England states, New York and New Jersey, work together through the environmental departments. Um, and with NMOA, they work on waste-related issues, including the Waste Site Cleanup Program. Uh, and one of the main priorities, I work primarily with the Waste Site Cleanup Program. One of their uh, priorities is training uh, of their own state staff, but we always try to invite um, others to attend the training as well, so everybody's on the same page and exposed to the same information. And another priority, of course, is PFAS. Uh, NMO has been focused on PFAS in our state since about 2016. So this is another effort at um, you know, providing training and, and information about PFAS. So we've got a, a, a nice webinar today uh, focused on uh, water and fish and shellfish and, and those issues. And we've got two good presenters. Uh, so part of the reason why I have the NMO website up here is because after the webinar, um, within a few days, it takes a few days, um, the presentations will be posted to the NMO website so you'll be able to access them own information. Uh, and I'll just show you where they are going to be, and then also um, all the other stuff there. So it's the no main homepage, nomoa.org. Then on the left side, you can find Waste Site Cleanup. After you click on that, you get to events. And then here's all our events. And the upcoming ones, uh, the one furthest out in the future is at the top, and then they kind of come back to being more recent. And then if you scroll down, uh, past events. So this will become a past event, PFAS and surface water, fish and shellfish today. Uh, but we've got a lot of other webinars that are coming up and eventually they'll be in the past <laughs> as well as ones we've done before. Um, so we just did one on wastewater as a, as a source of PFAS last week. And I'll just show you, um, you know, the, pre the presenters and their uh, presentations are, you know, linked up here. So you, this will happen again for today's webinar after fact. Um, so you'll be able to find the presentation. I will email everybody that's on the webinar today when those presentations are posted with a link to find them. So uh, we've got so many people on the web. Uh, on the um, webinar today that we will definitely have to do questions and answers uh, via the via question box. Uh, if you have a question, please type it in. Uh, when the presenter is done with their presentation, I will then go through the questions and ask of the So um, you can enter questions at any time. You don't have to wait for the presentation to be over. Uh, just if you have a question, please type it in. Um, and, and we will do the questions after each presenter um, is finished with their presentation. So first we'll have um, uh, Mr. McGivery and he'll, um, and after his presentation we'll do some questions, then we'll move on to uh, Mr. Murphy, and then after his presentation uh, we'll have more questions and answers. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ron McGivlery. McGivlery. Uh, he is. Let's see. I'm introducing here, and I'm making him the panelist. He's a senior environmental toxicologist at the Delaware River Basin Commission. His work includes characterizing contaminants of emerging concern, monitoring and toxicity, establishing water quality criteria, and designing field and laboratory studies for in the environmental assessment in the Delaware River and Bay. He's um, also an adjunct on the adjunct faculty at the University of Sciences, Sciences in Philadelphia. Prior to working at the Delaware River Basin Commission, he was a project scientist in the Fate and Effects Laboratory of Roy F. Weston Incorporated, which is now Weston Solutions. He's earned his PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Massachusetts in Boston. 
master's in microbiology from Rutgers and his bachelor in of science was in biology from Northeastern. So with that, take it away, Ron. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar. Um, as I said, I'm Ron McGilvery, and uh, I have, I'm in the photo here right on the left-hand corner of this photo. That's me. So first I yeah. wanted to start on, this is Jennifer. If you could just maybe get a little bit closer to your mic. Okay. Not quite clear. Okay. Okay. Is that, uh, uh, first I wanted to just introduce you to the Delaware River Basin Commission. Is that clearer? Yes, that's better. Okay. Um, the, the Delaware River Basin Commission was formed, and this is our anniversary year, 60 years ago. And it's an interstate federal compact agency with the four states, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and the federal government. And it's formed to have a unified approach to managing, protecting, and improving the shared waters, the Delaware River, uh, with the equal participation of the members. So um, the Delaware River has a history of ha being polluted. And you can see this picture on the left it was filmed in Philadelphia a paper years ago. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of uh, contamination, uh, drinking water concerns, uh, dissolved oxygen was very low. And um, that's one success story of the Delaware River Basin Commission and other uh, agencies have been working together and have really improved the uh, quality of the water in the Delaware River um, and for the DO. And we have an ongoing project to further improve dissolved oxygen. Another area is a PCB, uh, a TMDL, and the Pollution minimization plans that was another area that we have put a lot of work into recently. So in 2020, the Delaware River was uh, nominated as the River of the Year uh, because of a lot of work by a lot of different people uh, to improve the quality of the river, uh, the water quality in the river. And also there's a component of uh, water quantity that the commission works on, but I'm not as involved in that. So, but the, the topic of today is the uh, PFAS. So I'm not gonna get into the, the chemistry of PFAS so much other than showing you this, uh, this um, graphic on the right-hand top corner, uh, showing you that the, you, know, you have the carbon chain with the, the, the fluorine bond, which is a very strong bond. Uh, that is basically the reason why these compounds are so persistent in the environment. And you can see that they'll have different uh, groups attached, carboxylates or sulfonates. And then I like this graphic because it kind of shows, indicates even you know, the fish and other biota. When exposed to these uh, chemicals, uh, they get into the body and they go into different compartments of the body, the blood or the uh, muscle or the gonads. Um, so there is a concern about these compounds because they're, they're occurring in the environment. They're persistent in the environment. Many of them are bioaccumulative. And there's a wide range of toxicity. Human health effects include, um, there's both human health effects and aquatic life concerns. So human health effects uh, include associate, are associated with liver damage, increased cholesterol, thyroid disease, decreased response to vaccines, asthma, decreased fertility, and birth rate, pregnancy induced hypertension. Now, the aquatic life and aquatic dependent wildlife, there's still the, the magnitude of the toxicity there uh, is not as great as human toxicity, but there is concern. So if you're using the standard survival and growth and reproduction tests, uh, they would be kind of moderately toxic uh, compared to other chemicals. But there are increasing information about sublevel effects, sublethal effects, such as histopathology, neurology, uh, and immune effects that are being studied. So there's a lot to be learned about these compounds and there's a, a large group of these compounds too. I'm gonna to be focusing primarily on the uh, terminal PFAS, the uh, polyfluoroalkyl acids, but um, I'm gonna basically keep using the term PFAS for in general, these chemicals, these chemicals. So then why, why are we collecting PFAS data in surface water and fish? I mean, a lot of people may have heard of this as a concern for more of a drinking water 
issue. And often people are talking about what, the development of MCLs for drinking water. And also uh, in our area, a lot of the concern is with groundwater contamination um, from the um, contamination from the uh, a triple F foams, the firefighting foams. But with the PFAS, as for any other uh, contaminant of emergency concern, there's three questions we generally want to answer, or question, three questions we're asking and we want to answer. One are, is what are the occurrences and the sources of the PFAS in the basin? So that's important to us for the surface water and the biota, specifically fish. What are the risks to designated uses in the river? So uh, for one, source water protection for drinking water. A uh, second one would be uh, for human health, fish consumption. Do we need fish consumption advisories for this compound? And then also maintenance and propagation of fish and other aquatic life. Those are all designated uses that we want to make sure what assess the risk of these compounds to these designated uses. And then thirdly, what actions can be identified to minimize PFAS impacts and, and evaluate the effect, efficacy of regulatory and management strategies in reducing exposure and risk? I think one interesting aspect to the data I'm presenting today is that we started looking at these compounds pretty early and we have collected data over a period where there has been significant effort uh, to reduce re uh, uh, releases of the long chain compounds like the PFOS and PFOA um, due to the EPA stewardship program and different efforts by the basin states. So I'll get right into the sampling and, uh, and then talk about our, an out, our data. First, uh, let's look at the map on the left a little bit. Just that gives you an idea of the Delaware River Basin Commission, the first uh, very top left corner, where it's relation to the whole eastern uh, coast of the United States. And then you can see that it travels, the Delaware River travels between New York and Pennsylvania, then New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and then New Jersey and Delaware. Whenever you're standing on the shore of the Delaware River and looking across the river, you're always looking at a different state. That's why it's shared waters. Also, we have the, the river divided into different zones, zones one through six, and that, that's designated designed based on the physical chemical properties of the river um, and the land use and uh, anthropogenic inputs to the river. And they were developed years ago in the, in the 60s, but they really hold up based on the data collection. So when I present the data, I'm gonna just discuss it a bit in the different zones, but also you can think of the river in three main areas. One is the non-tidal river that's up in this area here, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. That's fresh water, it's non-tidal. That's our special, what we call our special protection water. That's another success story that we have for the Delaware River. That water, uh, in generally that area is pretty, uh, is forested. There's not a lot of urban and industrial development. And that water has exceeds water quality criteria. And we have a program in place to maintain that high quality water, not to, uh, so that is, uh, that area is our special protection water, non-tidal fresh water. That's one main area. And then as you're moving down, downriver, you get into the area that's tidal, and it's a tidal freshwater uh, river, which is a pretty long stretch of tidal freshwater. And that's also the area that is um, most heavily urbanized and industrialized. So that's this is the area where I've spent a lot of time in studying toxicity uh, and uh, different chemicals that, uh, in that area. And then the third main area is that you move out into the, and then you're moving, this is the tidal area here. You're moving a transitional area from fresh water to brackish water, and then you're moving into the bay. Uh, and in the bay, um, it, you can see it, the, the, the bay is kind of like a funnel shaped and it, the, the dynamics, the hydrodynamics of the bay are so that you have a lot of mixing and dilution that occur rapidly. So I think you'll, if you keep that in mind as we're looking at the data, you'll see that we see a general pattern that you're going to have low number concentrations in the non-tidal water, increased concentrations in the uh, freshwater tidal area in the urbanized area, and then some dilution in the bay. So we collected uh, surface water and fish, and I am going to speak a little bit about sediment too. We didn't do too much, but uh, we do have some sediment data. And the surface water was collected in 2007, 8, and 9 for six sites. And then we did 15 sites in 2015. We expanded a little bit. And then we went up into the non-tidal areas in 2016. I will say when we're looking at this data, 
uh, we don't have all the, it's not concurrent. So the fish, you can see here, the fish uh, surface water and the sediment is not, were not collected at the same time. So it's not, uh, we weren't targeting bioaccumulation factors or something like that at this time. Um, and the reason why it's pretty much was piggyback on the PCB uh, TMDL effort. That was our main effort. And we were able to put on this uh, contaminants and merchant certain effort on that work. So that's how we ended up getting this early data set. And then the fish, though, I think that's our most interesting data set. We have uh, uh, four sites in the non-tidal river, five sites in, in the tidal river, and we collected in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 10, 12, 15, and, and 18. And then we did the one uh, 15 sediment sites in 2016. So as far as the number of species we collected, we collected two tidal species white perch and channel catfish. And we collected two um, non-tidal species, smallmouth bass and white sucker. Now these are the fish that are historically collected to, in order to inform fish consumption advisories in the Delaware River. And that's why we, we uh, use them. Again, we're basically piggy piggybacking on previous uh, monitoring programs. We just added the, uh, these contaminants of emerging concern uh, initially. It's a composite of five fillet, so again, we're looking at only the muscle, the fish fillet, because that's uh, was their objective for informing human health concerns and fish con potential fish consumption advisories. And the fish were collected and they're of similar length and weight. As far as the surface water samples go and the sediment samples, we conduct we also uh, conducted opportunistic sampling that was, as I mentioned, not concurrent with the fish collection. And those samples were collected mid-channel. They were subsurface water grabs and collect it directly into the sampling into the containers. And then we used the Ponar stainless steel grab for the sediment. And we had blanks and duplicates for the water and sediment. The analytical methods, we have consistently used the same lab, uh, SGS Access Analytical Services in Sydney, uh, British Columbia, Canada. And we have 13 PFAS uh, analytes that we've measured in the that we analyzed in fish tissue, water, and sediment. And that's the, uh, that's the list there. Uh, and you can see that they're focused on the terminal uh, uh, alkyl acids. Um, the analytical methods that has been consistently used is the solid phase extraction with the weak anion exchange sorbent cartridge and the uh, liquid chromatography with the uh, double mass spec, mass spec with an isotope dilution method. So you see we have the uh, uh, C8, the PFOA, and the PFOS included. Uh, and then you'll see that we have um, the keep an eye out for the PFNA and the C9 and the uh, PFUNA C11. We, that they turn out to be an uh, um, important part of the story here. And so let's look at the data. For we'll look at the water sediment and then the, get into the fish, which I think is the more, most interesting part of our data set. So we did have water at different years, but I'm showing you a, a year, a couple of years that are pretty close for the water sediment and fish, just as a kind of a comparison. And if you're looking at the figure below, uh, you can see the kilometers and it's uh, up 500 is up like in New York State, moving down through the zone one, the nine tidal area. Moving into zone three and two is the um, uh, tidal freshwater river, and that's drinking a uh, drinking water source area. Two and zones one, two and three. But then when you move into zones five and four, that's where you're getting into the more industrialized area, and it's not drinking water. It's not source water for drinking water. And then zone six, you're moving out into the bay. So overall, we let's see that we have we we are below regional and national guidelines for PFAS in areas designated for drinking water sources. So when we say regional guidelines, I'm comparing the, the surface water to the MCLs that have been developed by New Jersey, the PFNA at 13 nanograms per liter, PFOS at 13 nanograms per liter, and uh, PFOA at um, 14 nanograms per liter. And we did not see that those exceedances uh, in the source areas for drinking water. Um, the zone one, the non-tail area, basically saw below detection limit for the most part. And then um, 
in zones, like as I mentioned, four and five is where we saw some concern. In the early 2007 water data, we saw 976 nanograms per liter of PFNA. That's the C9. And then, that, but luckily and thankfully, by uh, by 2015, most sites are below the detection limit for the PF, PFNA. So if I had that, you know, that would be off the chart here right now. So that would be a completely different figure if we have those early uh, data. Um, and that's because there's industrial releases of uh, PFNA in the area. P uh, and that's what we're, we, we kind of tracked in this study. Uh, PFOA and PFOS were frequently detected, but as I said, they were below the, basically below uh, the 10 nanograms per liter. Even in, uh, actually in, in zones four and five, even in, uh, by 2015, they were below the um, 10, 10 nanograms per liter. Uh, now, although we're seeing uh, reductions in the long chain uh, PFAS, the short chain PFAS uh, have been frequently detected with the hexa and the penta uh, maxima around 28.9 and 22.9 in 2015. So that's the last year we actually have water data that the DRBC has collected. And you can say, see, so we're not seeing the same decline for the short chains. So that's something when we go out, we're planning to go out in 2021. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and that's something we're going to be looking for. Um, and then zone six, as generally occurs, we see a lower concentration. And if you combine all the seven compounds that we uh, were detected in the water in zone six, they were combined with 38 nanograms per liter. And that's in the, the sample site that's up river a little bit. And then when you go out further down in the bay, it's even lower. Uh, so just briefly about the sediment, uh, I would say the take home message on the sediment in the Delaware River, like many other places, is that it's quite variable. Uh, for the frequency of detection and a wide range of concentrations. Uh, but we're uh, seeing uh, PFUNA and PFNA uh, are frequently detected in the sediment in, in the Delaware River and its tributaries. Um, that's a little different than other places where you generally are seeing a higher uh, PFOA, not PFOS. And um, it could be different if we're looking at different compounds. Within the compounds that we looked at, this is what we're seeing. So um, we did not collect sediment earlier on. We're going to try it in the future because it's generally a gravel and cobble bed and it's difficult to collect sediment. So we did not collect sediment in zone one, uh, but we're, uh, we're going to try to look for depositional areas in the future. Um, zones two and three, uh, the highest concentrations observed in sediment was PFOS at 0.8 micrograms per kilogram. And we did see some long chain PFAS uh, detected at low concentrations. Um, in the zones four and five, uh, most frequently detected were the uh, C11, C9, and uh, the PFOS. We only saw one site that had a, a very low amount of the uh, PFUNA, the C11, uh, in um, the zone six. Okay, so let's talk about the fish fillet. First, I'm going to give you a longitudinal look at it uh, over you know, the different uh, sites, and then I'm going to look at trends over the years. Um, so of the 13 analytes that were used, in the, that were studied, uh, six were detected in fish fillet. That's the PFOS, PFNA, PFDA, PFUNA, PFTOA, and PFOSA. I've mentioned a couple of them already, though. C10 is one I haven't mentioned, and the PFOSA. Uh, OSA is a sulfonamide, and that's considered a precursor. And then the DO is the, the C12. So concentrations vary by fish species and by location. Uh, and so let me look. So you're looking at this. If you're looking at the figure again, you're looking from the from right to left, you're going from up river, down river, and it's pretty much lower in the non in the zone one uh, non-tidal area, except for we did see. Um, Smallmouth bass, so it varies quite a bit by the species. So smallmouth bass, we did see some um, uh, PFAS in the smallmouth bass, even though, if you remember, we had pretty much not detect for PFAS in the uh, not in the zone one. So, like other uh, studies, we're seeing that um, you can get 
concentration of PFAS in fish, even if you're not seeing it uh, by certain grab samples of uh, surface water, then that could be explained by we're not uh, measuring uh, you know, some precursors and things like that, that may end, or that we're not capturing all the exposure that the fish are seeing to these compounds. Um, we are interested in potentially doing some studies on uh, passive samplers in the future. So, uh, so in zones two, three, four, and five, we did see the long chain uh, PFAS. They were detected in the tidal fish. And again, you'll see it varies by the, uh, significantly by which species you're looking at, whether it's channel catfish or a different species. And then the fish collection analysis that occurs in the bay is done by a different agency. So I don't have that data to present here. Uh, and they are kind of ramping up their analysis of uh, PFAS in that area. So let's look at the temporal trends now. So this not over this. Now this graph is different. If you look at the x-axis, it's the years, not the river uh, kilometers. It's the years. And I'm looking at the PFOS only. And the, the two on the left is the two um, tidal um, species. And on the right are the two non-tidal species. And the take-home message here is that the P, uh, PFOS concentration in the fish fillet of the four species tested appeared to be slowly decreasing. But we'll see that it's not as fast as we're seeing in some of the other PFAS. And, but unfortunately, um, the PFOS in the fish fillet is currently estimated to trigger restrictive fish consumption advisories. So New Jersey has developed uh, uh, trigger uh, risk-based trigger factors for uh, developing fish consumption advisories uh, for these uh, for three compounds. And they, the states, are the ones that develop the fish consumption advisories. We help to collect the data and to develop it. But the states actually finalize the fish consumption advisories. So a another temporal trend for the fish in this slide, now you're looking at the uh, PFUNA. And here, in this case, we have on the tidal, tidal fish again on the left side and non-tidal on the right. And the PFUNA concentration was highest in tidal fish with the known local discharge. Both tidal species, both the white perch and the channel catfish showed significant decreases though by uh, 2018. In, uh, and then what I did, you can see that I have uh, both detected and non-detected data, so sensor data. So I use the man candle uh, analysis for a trend if it's no sensor data and the uh, ATS analysis for uh, on in R if there was sensor data, if it was the non-detect data. Um, in the non-tidal river, the PFUNA uh, in the smallmouth bass also showed decreases in concentration over time with the white sucker without a clear decreasing trend. And as I mentioned, that it's not a known industrial release of PFUNA in the non-tidal water, but there could be some uh, uh, fluoroteller alcohols that may be uh, uh, um, precursors to PFUNA in that water that we haven't been haven't monitored yet. And then the PF. And a, the one that was of so much got so much attention, it was a, a lot of concern in the in the surface water when we first started taking collections samples in 2007, eight, and nine. When I first saw the data in 2007, I in the water I thought it was a lab error, but it was confirmed in 2008 and, nine, and by others. So if we're looking at the temporal trends for PFNA, and now just I'm just showing the uh, tidal fish, the channel catfish, and the white perch. Um, it was uh, high in the early years, but detected in the tidal, uh, tidal fish, it would decreased to below or near detection limits by 2018. So there's been a dramatic, significant, statistically significant reduction in this PFNA. And that makes sense since there's been a big reduction in the amount of this compound that's been released into the river. So the PFNA concentrations and trends are pursued to reflect early site specific releases and subsequent actions to reduce industrial discharges of PFNA to the tidal portion of the river. And the PFNA levels in the non-tidal river were below detection levels throughout the study. So I didn't show that. And then I will uh, just mention that PFOSA 
the uh, the sulfonamid is basically uh, other. This is in the tidal area of the channel catfish and the white perch. Occurrence of co-occurring precursors, as I've mentioned before, may influence bioaccumulation in in transient fish. So the PFOSA PFOSA had uh, highest concentration in tidal fish collected in 2012, with no significant trends observed through 2018. And then in the non-tidal water, we didn't see uh, that compound. So in summary, others have bigger data sets, more species, but I think that we had captured a, a, a nice, um, an interesting period of time when there were some changes in the releases of these compounds to the river. So the levels of PFOS in fish fillet are estimated to still trigger restrictive fish consumption advisories in the Delaware River. PFOS concentrations in fish fillet of the four species tested appear to be slowly decreasing, but would still are still of concern for fish consumption. The PFAS, PFAS, observed in fish and surface water indicate that further evaluation of risk to human health, aquatic life, and wildlife is warranted in the Delaware River. And the surface water samples collected from the tidal Delaware River between 2007 and 2015 did have elevated levels of um, the uh, PFUNA and PFNA in areas not designated for drinking water sources with uh, apparent decreases over the sample period. It's harder to do the trends in water, so I haven't really, I, can't say a statistically significant change, but it looks like the trends are definitely going down. Uh, surface water concentrations vary for other PFAS, but appear to be below regional and national guidelines for PFOS, PFOA in areas designated as drinking water sources in the Delaware River main stem. So, so you notice that we, in the last sample we have is 2015 for water and 2018 for fish. So basically the DRBC has shifted a little bit. At, you know, we're a small organization and we there was a lot of emphasis on uh, nutrients. So we've been working a lot on uh, a eutrophication model, but I, we have managed to get some external funding to do some more uh, PFAS analysis. Um, um, and that's what we're gonna, I'm going to mention to you what we're planning to do next. Based on one good thing is we had plenty of time to kind of look at that previous data and kind of see what we had and try to come up with what's the next step we should do. Uh, so we are focusing on a concurrent sampling of surface water, sediment, and fish in the tidal and non-tidal river. And a big difference is that we're also going, a second big difference is that we're going to uh, extend the list from to 40 uh, PFAS analytes, which will include precursors and some replacement compounds. So that's the list of the compounds that we're going to be using. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see it's a pretty extensive list. Um, and we are sticking, we are continuing to work with the, uh, the same lab, SGS Axis, and it's basically a similar uh, uh, method with the expanded analyte list. And um, I'm going to, I think we'll see, we're, look, we're interested to see, as I said, some of the large group of PFAS, we're trying to expand that list. And I would say, I guess the only other thing with, as far as expanding the list, we are looking, as I mentioned, looking into potentially doing some passive sample work and uh, non-target analysis and uh, total oxidi oxidizable precursors, but that's not in our schedule for 2021. But uh, I'll end with uh, my contact information, my uh, email address, <clears throat> also uh, the website for um, uh, the DRBC's Contaminant Emerging Concerns uh, uh, website, which includes the PFAS data, and also we did quite a bit of work with uh, pharmaceuticals and for uh, flame retardants. And if you want to read about this study a little more, it is published in the Integrated Environmental Assessment and Management under uh, Temporal Trends of PFAS in the Delaware River uh, Fish. So thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Ron. That was very interesting, and we have quite a few questions here, so we'll try to go through. Um, some of them for about 10 minutes here. Um, what is the PFOS, PFOS um, fish tissue advisory value? And and is that the same as New Jersey's or do you have different ones or could you tell yeah, us? Yeah, we're them? using, I'm using the New Jersey uh, values that, um, so it's like it's, it's there's three values based on um, uh, three, uh, 
like I think the lowest one actually is like 0.5. I think it's uh, 17, and then I believe it's 38. Those are the numbers, and they're basically the same. The, the numbers that New Jersey has developed. So I we like as I said, the state would be the states would determine the fish consumption advisories, but based on co comparing it to those numbers, which I did in the article that's here, um, it, there would be exceedances, like 80 percent of the compounds. And then I also compared it to like uh, European numbers and and uh, and uh, numbers from Australia, and we have like they, we would exceed those fish consumption advisory numbers also. Okay. Um, so uh, I think this is a really good question is, um, so the fillets is more how a human would eat fish, but how about, um, you know, in the natural environment, a lot of predators eat the fish whole. So have you done any um, analysis of the whole fish and are you looking at the impact on other species? We are not because uh, we're uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, informing the fish consumption advisories. Um, I do, I do think there's a lot to be considered as related to uh, um, aquatic dependent wildlife because it's known that, uh, uh, you know, fish that have gills are taking these compounds up, but they're also uh, releasing them pretty quickly. Uh, some of them. And, but the uh, uh, air breathing organisms that are eating the fish, I think they have a higher capacity to bioaccumulate. And there has been work done for peregrine falcons and for uh, uh, aquatic like dolphins that show high levels of these compounds in those uh, um, biota in the Delaware River. But it's, you know, we, we're scrambling to keep, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we had a couple of years we weren't able to do any, any collection of data. So, I'm scrambling to get external funding to do more data, but it has to be, uh, you know, it's it's limited. But I think that's a definitely area that needs attention. Okay. Um, how about looking at tributaries to the Delaware River? Have you done any uh, sampling up any of the tributaries and identified potential, I guess, part of probably I would, the edge, potential sources that are coming in? Okay, well, that's kind of two different questions. So I'll answer the tributary. Uh, this We did not do the tributaries in this study, but we did work with New Jersey and the EPA uh, uh, um, labs that they did a big study uh, in New Jersey tributaries. And um, the Pennsylvania DEP with the USGS just released a very extensive study uh, in um, Pennsylvania on these compounds, and they did some uh, Delaware tributaries in that. So working together, trying to fill, we're trying to fill gaps. And we're responsible for the shared water. That's the main stem. And the tidal tributaries are also part of our uh, uh, mission, but uh, the primary uh, task we have is the shared main stem water. Okay. Um, as far, I want to say also, as far as finding sources, that's uh, something we're definitely uh, looking into, uh, talking to the states and, how we can try to, you know, there's a lot of conversations about uh, whether wastewater should be monitored, things like that. So we are looking at that, but that's not what this study did. Okay. How about uh, sediment sampling depth for the sediment sampling? It's, it's surf surficial, and we just did the ponar grab, so it's not exactly, we didn't do any co cores or anything like that, although that would be very interesting because it's definitely historic, you know, trends on these compounds, but we didn't. It's a sufficient uh, sediment, sa sediment sample. Okay, when you're doing the sediment sampling, are you going to be looking at any of the benthic organisms? And do you have a sense whether they've got? Um, we have, I, I would say the only, th I, I haven't seen too much data on that, but we do have some, we had a caged mussel study that was done for a different reason in the basin. And I'm trying to uh, get funds to have those mussels uh, analyzed. So I do think it would be interesting to see, and I think yeah, it, to see what's happening, uh, because I think there could be actually the data, some reports are there could be different PFAS in the sediment and it could be, you know, that's worth looking at, but we didn't look at that. Okay. Um, do you have a sense whether um, the decrease in levels of PFOS and PFNA and fish fillets is due to the decrease in use? of these long chain PFAS or just a switch? <laughs> the I think chain. that's, I, I, I think 
well, I, maybe I shouldn't speak too clearly about this, but I think it seems to me, and based on other data, we, you're seeing that pre, we're seeing a statistically significant reduction in PFNA, PFUNA. Those two were released from an industrial site. That's a site-specific release. The PFOS, um, not as much. So I think that may be you're getting consumer you know, releases, a lot more different releases, and you're not. That's one explanation why you're not seeing as much a, a reduction in the PFOS as you are seeing in those other two, which were def, like cut off. They were unique chemicals that you know not generally found everywhere. They're found other places, but not as common as the PFOS. OS and not as in many as many products. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, does your expanded list of analytes? I'm not a chemist, so I don't know. But does it include a re the replacement compound for PFNA? I'm not sure what that compound is, but <laughs> good question. I think that one actually uh, no. We have the P the Gen X and Adana, but not the replacement for the. PFNA, that's, uh, I forget the name of that one, but we don't have that one in the list. Mm. Okay. So you got me on that one. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here's some, some people have particular questions here. Do you think the Gibstown Logistics Center will have an effect on future path values? And explain what that is. I'm not familiar with that. The Gibstown Logistics Center is a, 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 a a dock that's um, being built in New Jersey, and it's very controversial. And I'm not authorized to talk about that topic. And it's not—I don't think it's going to have that much effect on. I will. I'm, I'm not going to speak to that. Address that topic. Yeah. yeah, I guess any work along a river could stir up sediments or things. So you never. Yeah, it's hard to know. Could be, um, you know, you could, yeah. Right. And I guess. Just for I'm not, that, I don't have the information to address that that question at this time. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Are there thoughts about sampling uh, for PFAS in the fields and the you know in parts of the floodplain that that um, can be impacted when the river does flood? Uh, that's not part. Of, that's not something we're considering looking at. But um, I don't know if you mean the like the, I didn't mention the fringing wetlands that are like a, a characteristic of our, the Delaware Bay. Um, but um, that's not part of what we're going to study. But it would be worth um, potentially looking at, I guess. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess um, just as some background that might be helpful. Uh, the the river itself, the Delaware River, is a huge river. So the fact that it has PFAS, you know, at levels that you can find is 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 um, a little concerning to me. But um, uh, are, not a are, there, are there particular dischargers, you know, and manufacturers and uh, of these chemicals that you've been finding? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so do you know what's changed um, in those sources? Uh, you know, what? Well, for the PFNA, as I always mentioned, that they, they kind of changed the formulation. They're not using that compound, they're using a different, uh, they switched their, their production. Okay. Um, oh, oh, okay. Um, and I guess one more before we before we switch uh, presenters here. But um, are there any common issues that have come up with that, like analytical analytical methods and QAQC and your tissue sampling, or any um, lessons learned that you can impart to others about the exact you know the, the sampling and analysis part of it? Well, I do think the isotope dilution method is the way to go, um, and. Um, I do think you need to have plenty of, uh, you know, controls, your your blanks and your duplicates. So, and there's lots of document work, documents out, like the DOD do document uh, for, you know, on uh, PFAS uh, monitoring. And New York State has a really good uh, guidance out on um, PFAS um, uh, monitoring. So I think there's there's there's, uh, there's you can develop defensible data, I believe. 
So that's that's some people are concerned that you know the, 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 the I guess the less lesson I would say is isotope dilution and plenty of controls. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ron. Ron, I think is going to stay with us, uh, so he'll be available at the very end also for questions. But I think in the interest of time, we should move on. I'm going to switch the presenter over to Michael Murphy. He is currently the principal risk assessor and the risk assessment group leader in the Chelmsford, Massachusetts Office of Wood, Environment, and Infrastructure Solutions. Um, he has extensive risk assessment experience with circle projects as well as waste sites regulated under more than 20 state programs. He began his professional career with, uh, with eight years as an environmental analyst in the Office of Research and Standards at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and a Master's in Public Health from the University of North Carolina. So with that, um, Ron can take it away. Mm, there we go. Oh, I don't hear you though, Mike. Are you there? Oh, goodness. We see his slides. Now we just need to get his voice. It's unmuted on my part. So, hmm. We were talking earlier. I don't could hear him. So he's, he's there. Oh. I think he's decided to call in with the telephone. So we'll have to wait here a minute, folks. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Michael, are you there? All right, well, bear with us. Hopefully, you'll just take him another minute or two to get in here. Michael, are you there? Yes, I am, Jennifer. I was having difficulty with the computer audio, so I've called in on the telephone. Okay, great. Well, I can hear you and I can see your slides, so go ahead. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon. Thanks for this opportunity to summarize the site inspection work for PFAS in surface water sediment and shellfish for the former Pease Air Force Base in Newington and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I just would like to say that this work that I will be summarizing has been conducted on behalf of the United States Air Force. And with that, I'll move along here. You can just click, if you click into the slides, then it should be able to advance. There you go. Just a, a very brief bulleted list of the presentation content. And uh, the, the photo here is actually a, um, a view of one of the uh, surface drainage features at the site where it, um, the drainage feature is called Peverly Brook, and this is where it, at its mouth, where it meets Herod's Cove. So just in the way of introduction to the site, um, this work is, is being done under CERCLA. This is an investigation and remediation activity. The site is a former Air Force base with a history of aqueous film forming foam. These foams were used in firefighting to suppress fires 
uh, for a long period of time, and they're a known source of PFAS compounds. Uh, there has been a previous site inspection for SI for PFAS at the site, and PFAS compounds have been identified in groundwater and drinking water sources. And as a result, uh, there has been drinking water mitigation, groundwater remediation, and treatment of drinking water supplies. The particular project that I'm talking about today is an investigation that's limited to surface water sediment and aquatic biota, but the expanded site inspection of PFAS also includes soil and groundwater. We um, we will be conducting a remedial investigation as a follow-up to the expanded SI work. And uh, I'll go to the next slide. For those of you who may not know, under the US EPA circle process, there are several steps of investigation, starting with a site investigation, the expanded site investigation, which I'll be describing today, then we go to a remedial investigation feasibility work plan and then a remedial investigation feasibility and then proposed plans and then conducting remedies. Now, our particular project objective is to evaluate the migration of PFAS from source areas at the site into multiple surface drainage features and receiving water bodies, and, and particularly important to evaluate potential human exposure and risks associated with PFAS in those drainage features. This is all being done as part of the expanded SI. We have identified the surface water features We've done site recon on all of those features to understand their configuration, their, uh, their potential for human contact with surface water sediment and biota. And we're doing this to develop a human health and ecological risk assessment conceptual site model and evaluate the need for further investigation. This is a physical conceptual site model for the, the site. So as you can see here, there are several boxes moving from left to right. The primary sources are site eight, which was a source of contamination of all of the organic compounds. But it's also, uh, we have a fire department equipment testing area, another fire training area, and a former crash fire station are the primary sources of PFAS. And that PFAS has moved the soil at the site, and then from soil, that has moved into the stormwater system, is percolated into soil, into groundwater, and then subsequently, into surface water as well. As we move across this slide, we're investigating now freshwater, surface water, and sediment, and estuary surface water and sediment, as well as uh, shellfish in the uh, estuary. This figure shows the location of the former Air Force Base, uh, and as you can see here, the, the main runway for the Air Force Base was in this area, and currently the site is used as a trade port, the area. There's also an Air, Air, Air National Guard Base, and there's a National Wildlife Refuge. 
as you can see, the site is located on a peninsula that is surrounded by water. To the west, Little Bay and Great Bay, which are tidal, water bodies, estuary, and the Piscataqua River to the west, um, or to the east. And um, the The site now um, is a mix of the trade port, the Air National Guard, and the surrounding areas on the areas on the fringes of the peninsula, a uh, mix of industrial, commercial, and also residential uses in certain locations. We conducted in person, you know, on the ground reconnaissance of the drainage basins and the drainage features around the site to understand for each of the brooks, streams, and ponds, the physical accessibility, depth, and width of the water, evidence of fishing, boating, swimming, hunting, and those types of things in land use, residential, industrial, and undeveloped land to understand human potential exposure pathways and scenarios. We also uh, contacted and worked with New Hampshire Marine Fisheries and Shellfish Program to understand shellfish harvesting areas and commercial and recreational fishing in the area and we engage members of the remediation advisory board. This figure shows, first of all, the A triple F, the, the source areas, which are identified in pink shading, as you can see here and here and here. Also shows the drainage features, which are all of the brooks. As you can see here, we have Knights Brook and Mill Pond. Pickering Brook here that flows in this direction. We have Pebbly Brook, which flows to the south, down here to Herod's Cove. And we have um, Flagstone Brook as well over here. The McIntyre Brook here that actually it drains the stormwater from the runway area. This map also shows the groundwater flow direction with these arrows. And as you can see, groundwater flows radially, radially in all directions from this basic high elevation area, which is the source area and the location of the former fire training area. So groundwater flows in all directions and surface water also flows radially from the center here out towards the water bodies adjacent. This, this photograph just simply shows one of those drainage features. This, this photo to the left is a photo of the brook itself, which is really not a very large brook. But that brook drains here into Broad Cove. This photograph indicates where the brook actually enters the cove. This is a photograph at low tide. And then this photograph is high tide in the further out from the mouth of Knight's nice Brook, um, showing the full range of physical conditions. We, we used this map, which is a map of shellfish harvest classification. This is um, prepared by the state and it identifies where shellfishing is allowed, 
where it's restricted, where it's prohibited. And uh, we use this information to select locations where shellfish could be collected uh, for investigation and it could be known to be present where people could harvest them. The field effort um, for this work, which included the collection of surface water, sediment, and shellfish sampling, can be summarized very quickly here with this figure. Uh, there were 26 freshwater surface water samples collected along the various brooks that are present here. These rectangles each represent samples where surface water sediment or shellfish samples were collected. You can see that we had good coverage on the peninsula along all the drainage features that were identified and where those drainage features enter the surface water bodies uh, on the perimeter of the peninsula. We also collected samples the surface water sediment and shellfish at reference locations, one here at Comet Creek and one here, which is up at the mouth of the Bellamy River. These sites are remote from the site area, but they are located in similar physical conditions to the brooks and streams that we've evaluated. As you can see here, we've collected surface water samples from the freshwater brooks as well as the estuary sediment samples, 21 freshwater samples from the freshwater brooks, nine from the estuary here and here, and 61 shellfish samples from the estuary at these locations in the reference areas, as well as at the mouth of each of these brooks that drain into the estuary. This is a detailed summary of the shellfish samples that were collected. The main point to take away from this slide is not to look at all of the details, but to understand that we collected three types of shellfish, soft shell clams, American oysters, and blue mussels. We collected them all three at any location where they were present. And um, if they weren't all three present, we collected those that were available. It's an extensive shellfish collection program for this in inspection effort. This is a photo of, of the shellfish. Uh, to the left, the soft shell clams, the blue mussel in the center, and the American oyster on the right. Once all of the samples were collected, surface water sediment and shellfish uh, they were submitted for laboratory analysis. This is the analyte list, which includes 13 PFAS compounds. And listed here are the reporting limits uh, for surface water sediment and shellfish, uh, the reporting limits as you can see here for surface water, uh, the, the lowest reporting limits are 15 parts per trillion. Uh, the sediment, 0 0.88 parts per billion, and the shellfish, 0 0.567 parts per billion. These 13 compounds are those that have previously been detected and groundwater at the site. Laboratory analysis is, was conducted by um, Maxim Analytics International for surface water and sediment in the first phase of the program using EPA methods 
537 and modified, and then subsequently by Bureau Veritas and General Engineering Laboratories for Surface Water and Sediment and Shellfish. Um, these laboratories use the Department of Defense analytical approved method for PFAS using liquid chromatography tandem mass with isotope dilution, similar method to um, was described in the previous presentation. And these and these um, laboratories are Department of Defense Laboratory accredited as well. So I, I now would like to describe uh, the tool, the primary tool that we're using to evaluate the results of the surface water sediment and shellfish sampling results. These are the US EPA health risk-based screening levels. The sediment surface water and for shellfish and shellfish consumption. These screening levels were developed by US EPA Region 1 uh, using the toxicity information that has been published by US EPA for three of the compounds on the analyte list, FPFBS, PFOA, and PFOS, PFOA and PFOS. And these screening levels are, uh, as I said, based on risk for different exposure scenarios. The sediment is based on a child waiting scenario, the surface water, swimming, both child and adult. And then for fish consumption, which we're not using here, uh, a, a adult and child, and self, shellfish, adult and child screening levels as well. So this is the tool or the benchmark that we're using to evaluate the results for PFDS, PFO, and PFOS. US EPA has not published risk-based screening levels for the other 10 PFAS compounds that are on the analyte list. The New Hampshire DES has also calculated and published PFAS screening levels that have been used by the DES to simultaneously evaluate the data that have been collected. As you can see here, uh, the New Hampshire DES has screening levels of five compounds, including the PFDS, P4, PFOS, but in addition, PFHXS and PFNA. The New Hampshire DES screening levels for, for the three compounds that EPA has published numbers for are slightly lower, or in some cases, substantially lower than the EPA numbers. And the difference is based on toxicity values calculated by the New Hampshire DES that are different than the toxicity values published by US EPA. So I would like to, if we can go through the summaries of the analytical results for our sampling and show at the same time the comparison of those results to the screening levels. So this is a summary of freshwater surface water data for all of the brooks and streams that were evaluated. And I'm going to show a series of these summaries. In each summary, I'm going to show a table with the data, and I'm going to show a figure that shows the distribution of compounds 
in a couple of representative samples. So in this table, first of all, we have the screening level, the SL, which is the screening level for the child and adult swimming for, for surface water. And then we have the frequency of detection. You can see here that these three compounds were detected quite frequently. We have a minimum and maximum detection. We compared the maximum detected concentration of each of the compounds to the screening levels. And then we indicate here the number of detections that have uh, concentrations above the screening level. Here, in this case, the surface water, freshwater surface water, uh, the screening levels are exceeded in five of 26 samples for PFOS but the screening levels are not exceeded by PFPS or PFO. And then to see the full range of results for all of the analyte lists, we can see here uh, this graph is represents the percent contribution of each compound to the total concentration of PFAS in that sample. So for example, um, th these are the compounds on this axis. This ax vertical axis is percent contribution. You can see here that PFOS in this sample for pickling group listed in orange. The PFOS concentration in that sample represents 49.9% of the total concentration of all of the PFAS compounds in the sample. Looking in this figure, what we see is that PFOS, PFHXS, and PFHXA are the predominant compounds in that sample. PFOS, PFHXS, HXS, and we see that clearly. We see that PFOS is the one that is predominant. It has the highest concentrations among the chemicals in that sample. The PFOS concentrations that were above the screening level were from Pickering Brook, Watering Brook, Flagstone Brook, Paul Brook, and Knights Brook. Um, fortunately, the five locations where there were exceedances of the swimming screening level, the conditions in the brook are not suitable for swimming, so that the exceedance of the screening levels is a conservative screening um, tool, but swimming is really not possible at the locations where this happened. The water was shallow and the configuration was not suitable for swimming. We now go to the freshwater sediment. Uh, just first of all, point out in the table, you can see here the number of detects above the screening level, none for the three target compounds, so all of the concentrations of these compounds in sediment were the EPA screening level for sediment, indicating that there's minimal risk for uh, weighting in the water bodies that we evaluated. And then in the graph below, you can see that by far PFOS is the most predominant compound in sediment in the freshwater brooks and streams. Now we move to the estuarine surface water. This is a sample slope collected at the mouth of each of the streams in the estuary. Um, the bottom line here again, number of detects greater than the child screening level for swimming, none. All of the concentrations were below the risk-based screening levels for a swimming scenario. And then looking at the graph, 
in the distribution of compounds. We see that, again, PFOS is the predominant compound in the estuarine sur surface water, and PFHSS was the second uh, highest contributor, contributor to the total concentration of PFAS in the sample. So, Mike, you just have about five minutes. Hopefully, okay. okay. Um, I will move on quickly. Um, this is the estuarine sediment. Bottom line again here is that none of the concentrations were above the screening level for child waiting. So surface water and sediment conclusions, very little evidence of recreational use for the freshwater features. And PFOS, PFOS, and PFES we had detected were below screening levels, indicating that uh, health risk, risk associated with these compounds in these water bodies was minimal. And moving on to the uh, soft shell clam tissue data. Again, the bottom line here is in this particular table, we have target sample locations at the site and the reference area locations in the bottom, the bottom line, number of detects with concentrations above the child screening level, which is the most conservative one, none. So all of the soft shell clam tissue data samples had concentrations below the health risk-based screening levels, the soft shell clams. Similar table here for blue muscle data collected in the estuary locations. Once again, the bottom line, all the concentrations were below the screening level of blue muscle, both in the um, site related locations and reference locations. Again, with the American oyster, similar situation concentrations are substantially lower in the tissue than in than the screening levels. None of the tissue concentrations were above the screening levels. Shellfish data observations and conclusions. There were only four PFAS compounds that were detected, PFBA, PFOSA, PFOS, and PFPEA. For the target area, the shellfish um, PFOS was most frequently detected. PFO and PFBS, which are two of the three compounds that, P, that EPA has published screening levels for, were not detected in any shellfish samples. Uh, so the bottom line here is that the, the screening evaluation for shellfish does indicate that there are low levels of PFOS and these three other compounds, but those levels are not indicative of any type of substantial risk for people who might be consuming them. The conclusions and path forward here for this study, uh, the freshwater, surface water, and sediment data indicate minimal health risk for PFOS, PFOA, and PFBS, the current recreational exposure pathways, consumption of freshwater fin fish from identified site-related drainage features is unlikely uh, just based on the configuration of those brooks and streams, and the low concentrations of PFOS in shellfish um, indicate minimal risk from shellfish harvesters. The primary sport fish in Great Bay and Little Bay, the migratory striped bass with limited residence time in the area and limited time for uptake of PFOS, PFOA, and PFBS. And additional investigation of direct human exposures to PFOS, PFOA, and PFBS and freshwater and estuarine surface water and sediment 
our consumption of shellfish is not planned. However, data gaps are currently being evaluated and the IR and the remedial investigation work plan is in progress. Just a, a couple quick comments before I wrap up here. In addition to these direct exposures to surface water and sediment, that are currently in the RI work plan, some consideration for addressing potential consumption of wild game that might drink surface water from these impacted brooks and streams and also to evaluate consumption of backyard produce, fruits and vegetables and animal products such as meat, eggs and dairy that might be irrigated with or might be fed with surface water. And then I'd just quickly like to acknowledge that there are a tremendous number of people and organizations that contributed to this investigation and study, including the Air Force, our offices in Maine and Massachusetts, the laboratories I mentioned, US EPA New England, New Hampshire DES, New Hampshire Marine Fisheries, and Shellfish Program, members of the Pease Restoration Advisory Board, representatives of the Pease Trade Port, and the citizens of Newington and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And then uh, I've also provided my contact information uh, with my Wood email address and phone number. And that concludes my presentation. And if we have any questions or discussions, I would welcome that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so, a couple of questions. What uh, and this is for you or Ron, uh, or both, um, what is the level of fish consumption that um, these, you know, sort of the, the uh, advisory levels are based on? Do you know? Yes, I do. I, I do have that information. The, the fish consumption screening levels, the shellfish, um, the, the, I, I don't have the specific Day, average daily intake here handy, but it, it is um, the numbers are based on US EPA and New Hampshire DES concurred with not a subsist, subsistence level of, of consumption, but consumption of shellfish on the order of uh, one meal per week um, on average. I, I can, uh, as a follow-up, provide the reference to the EPA um, calculations and the actual consumption rates. Okay, yeah, you could even add that to a slide uh, before you send yeah. it to me. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, these slides uh, from both presentations today will be posted on the NMO website um, eventually. It takes a little while, probably by uh, end of this week or early next week, and I will send an email out when they are ready. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, now, while you didn't really find too much in the shellfish, um, was there one species, because you sampled three different species, I think, was there one that tended to have, have uh, concentrations more than others? or are they all similar? Uh, actually, the, the concentrations were quite similar. And the interesting thing is that the, the concentrations were actually very similar among the three species. Um, uh, Probably, let's see, they're, they're within a factor of 50% um, um, among, among the clams, the blue mussel, 
and the oysters. Okay. So there was consistency in what compounds were detected and consistency in the concentrations among the three species. Okay. Um, somebody from New York, I guess, is commenting that in New York State, marine waters, there's elevated PFOS, P-F-O-S, in blue crab, um, so near an air base that's there. So are blue crabs present um, in, in the, near the peas, and uh, have you evaluated those? You know, I'd have to consult with, with our, our biologists about the, the presence of blue crabs. Um, the, and I will do that. And I can also add that to a slide um, in response to that question. Okay. And a couple more here. Um, can you just... Um, Say whether when you look at the fish, were you were you doing fillets or the whole fish? Okay, so we evaluated shellfish. So we we collected multiple um, clams, mussels, uh, or oysters, and then they were composited and homogenized. Um, you know without the shell, uh, several of the individual clams, mussels, and oysters were composited, homogenized, and then analyzed. So we were, we were analyzing the same material that would be consumed. Right. Okay. Um, here's, um, so there's the blue crabs, but also how about lobsters? Don't, don't New Hampshire have lobsters? Yes, and actually, I was speaking with one of my colleagues, Amy Quinton, who was involved in a lot of this work and did a lot of this work. And she mentioned to me today that uh, the Restoration Advisory Board members and other people from the community were interested in uh, doing some work to collect and analyze for PFAS in local lobsters. So that is something that is currently being discussed. Okay. Um, um, here's just a general question, which is what motivated the Air Force to do all this sampling? Was it because they had high PFAS concentrations in the groundwater that they thought might be also contributing or? Yeah. So that, that's an interesting question, and I, I think it's an important one. Um, early in the presentation, I spoke about a conceptual site model. And in the circle process, the EPA circle process, there's a big emphasis on conceptual site models. And a conceptual site model for a site like this involves identifying sources of contamination and then looking at how those, those contaminants migrate in the environments. And um, in the site inspection report and in, in the identification of PFAS contamination in groundwater that was substantial, a conceptual site model was being built and Part of that was evaluating migration of the groundwater, where it flowed, what directions, and it also involved evaluating whether or not there was groundwater discharging to surface water. So part of that investigation included collecting pool water samples in some of these brooks, and that determined that there was, in fact, groundwater discharging up into the, these brooks and that PFAS had been detected in that pool water. So once that was found, and it was understood that groundwater was discharging to some of these brooks and streams, then the natural or the logical progression was then to identify which brooks and streams were impacted by 
either groundwater discharging to them or uh, having something like stormwater drainage system discharging to the streams. So that it was a follow the migration pathways and that was part of the complete development of the conceptual site model that's required in the EPA circular process. And it, all of this is ultimately tied to evaluating not just where the contamination is, but what the risk is to the human and ecological receptors. Great. Well, we are right at, according to my computer here anyway, three o'clock. So we're at the end of time. I think I got through most of the questions. Um, so both presenters included their contact information in their slides, so you can contact them directly with any further questions. And like I said, the slides will be posted on the NMOA website, and I will send an email out to everybody that attended today when they are available, so you'll be able to know that they're available. Um, so with that, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today, and particularly our two presenters, uh, Ron and, and Mike, for their, for their great presentations and their um, good question and answer sessions. So thanks to everybody. And um, I think with that, I'm going to end the webinar and wish everybody a good rest of your day. So thank you. Oh, one more thing. We have a bunch of webinars still to come in this series. So again, they're on the NMOA website if you're not already, already aware. Um, and an email will probably go out speaker next week, and you'll get that too. <laughs> so anyway, um, thanks to everybody. Thanks again to Ron and to, and to Mike. And um, with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.